Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Career Development Corner webinar series. We can go ahead to the next slide. Cool. Here we go. Um, very good. Um, we do want to remind you that um, registration for the ACRM annual conference is open and it is still early bird rates through the end of June. So we do hope you'll join us there as well. Next slide, please. Today is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sue Ann Sisto um, for our webinar. Um, and she will talk about history and pathways for women in science and rehabilitation. Uh, Dr. Sisto is a professor and chair at the Department of Rehabilitation Science in the School of Public Health and Health Professions at the University of Buffalo, and she is also a past president of ACRM. Next slide, please. Um, before we get started, um, just reminders to please mute your mic. Your audio might be better with headphones, so please have those ready. Um, if you do want to um, ask questions, we ask you to use the chat. We will address questions at the end of Dr. Sisto's presentation. And um, just be kind, courteous, and flexible to one another. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Sisto. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank Drs. Kogan and Backus for inviting me to this webinar um, that I'm going to present to you today. I'm very excited about it. It's a passion of mine. And I'll be discussing the history and pathways of uh, for women in science and rehabilitation. My contact information is up on the first page should you wanna reach out to me at any future point. So I'll be discussing four major areas for this presentation. The first is um, the history of women in science and rehabilitation to give you some inspiration for what women have done for us in the past. Then I'll be discussing the barriers and facilitators to advancing women in rehabilitation fields. Next, I'll be discussing strategies for navigating uh, research and clinical pathways, and finally reviewing and discussing some pointers for the future. And this is where I hope to have some time left over 10 minutes or so to have a discussion and chat about some of your unique situations if you, if you so desire. I also have, um, not sure if you can see, but I have a, sort of a narrative on the bottom so that if there's anybody that might have um, a need to read and have difficulty hearing me, you can also use that as a resource for accessibility purposes. So in the introduction for the first section, we'll be talking about the history and pathways of women in science and rehabilitation. I'd like to point out two great books that I often read and have used over the years when looking at uh, situations uh, discussing women in science. So the first is Women in Science, 50 Fearless Pioneers Who Changed the World by Rachel Ignatowski. The second is Headstrong, 52 Women Who Changed Science and the World by Rachel Swaby. What's really nice about these two books is that they, each woman is covered in about three pages, just highlights about what they, where they came from and what they accomplished, whether it be an invention or a new discovery or some medical field. And what I like about it is they, they de describe some of the disparities um, that were mo much more prevalent than where some of the discoveries and accomplishments were actually acknowledged by the man first or maybe not the woman at all. So, so these are two really interesting books and there are many others, but these are really easy reads. So I will be discussing five wonderful, amazing women who are from our, the early years uh, and what they accomplished. I will be talking about Hypatia of Alexandria, Florence Sabin, Helen Brooke Tausig, Alice Ball, and Jane Wright. So first, Hypatia of Alexandria was born in 370 and died in 415. Amazingly, she's a mathematician, scientist, and philosopher at a time when women did not make these accomplishments. Um, and I wanted to tell you that this woman was 
quite amazing as a mathematician, scientist, and philosopher. She was the most renowned Greek mathematician and scientist of her day. She lived in Roman-ruled Alexandria in Egypt, and she was the head of the Platonist school in Alexandria and the last librarian of the Library of Alexandria, the most extensive library of the ancient world. She was unique in her day for being a very well-respected female, which again was not very common in that era at all. And she was much beloved and sought after by students for her teachings and politicians for her perspective and advice. Quite an amazing woman. Sadly, she was uh, martyred for her religious beliefs very early in her life. Florence of Sabin was a physician and medical researcher born in 1871 and died in 1953. She was regarded as the preeminent female scientist of the first half of the 20th century. While studying at Johns Hopkins Medical School, she was the first woman to graduate from and hold a full professorship at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And she made groundbreaking contributions to the understanding of the lymphatic system. While studying at medical school, she also created an atlas to the anatomy of the brain which was, was to be used by medical students for decades to come. Upon retirement, she wasn't finished yet. She campaigned for improved public health and resulted, which resulted in the Sabin health laws and where she saw rates of tuberculosis decrease dramatically. She was the first woman to be elected to the National Academy of Sciences and Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. Quite an amazing woman. Another woman is Helen Brooke Taussig, born in 1898 and died in 1986. She was the founder of pediatric cardiology and made revolutionary discoveries in the treatment of various pediatric heart diseases. She contributed to the understanding of cyanosis or the blue baby syndrome. She figured out that these babies had holes in their hearts and prevented proper oxygen delivery, causing them to turn blue. She developed an open heart surgery technique to fix the blue baby syndrome um, and using open heart surgery when it really was not widely used in medicine at that time. And that to this day, it's called the Blaylock Taussig shunt or the BT shunt. Blaylock was a man who joined her later on, but the shunt was named after the man first, the woman second. And this is not unusual. She accomplished her goals despite having severe dyslexia as a child. This is our rehabilitation connection here where she overcame this with hard work and tutoring from her father and early career, in her early career, she also became deaf. So she learned how to read lips and to feel her patient's heartbeats with her fingers instead of a stethoscope. In 1954, she was the, awarded the Albert Lasker Award for Outstanding Contributions in Medicine and the Presidency of the American Heart Association among many other awards. Alice Ball was a chemist born in 1892 and died in 1916, a short life. She developed an injectable oil from the Chalamuga tree in Molokai, which is a, a location on the Kalapala Island of Hawaii, in Hawaii. And she developed a treatment for leprosy and was the first in the, in the world to create this formulation. So the Kalapapa, Kalapapa Island in Hawaii was sort of the place where all people who had leprosy were taken for the rest of their lives. Um, and it was a location called Molokai. If any of you have read this book called Molokai, it's quite an amazing story. And she was the first to create this formulation, which previously had had been um, an oil-based uh, that was not compatible with the skin. It was thick, it was viscous, it just laid under the skin. And she created the, the, 
the composition such that it was actually a treatment for leprosy um, at a very young age of 22. In 1915, she was the first woman, an African-American woman to earn a graduate degree from the College of Hawaii. Her parents went there because they looked for some relief from um, rheumatoid arthritis. Sadly, in a class she was instructing, she inhaled chlorine gas and died. And that was why her life was so short. Two years later, all leprosy patients were discharged from the hospital, never to, to return to Kalapapa. Four years later, no new leprosy patient was exiled to Kalapapa after receiving this injectable form of Chalamugra oil, all due to this great, amazing woman, a barrier-breaking chemist. And finally, Jane Cook Wright was born in 1919, died in 2013, a cancer physician and researcher. She developed nitrogen mustard as a treatment for leukemia from autopsies of the deceased within a sunken Navy ship loaded with mustard gas. Unfortunately, when this ship uh, was sunk, all of the people died on the ship uh, from mustard gas. She, when she did autopsies of these people, she discovered that they had, uh, they had uh, white blood cells that actually she discovered were a treatment for um, various types of leukemias and cancer. So she worked on several other drug cocktails to beat breast cancer. She became a doctor of the Cancer Research Foundation at Harlem Hospital in her mid thirties in 1952. But she spent the next 22 years taking samples from tumors to drive drug selection and delivery and did not waste patients precious time who had been diagnosed with cancer and would have received the wrong kind of treatment for their type of cancer. She developed ways to deliver drugs to organs via catheters, and she's known as the mother of chemotherapy. In 1967, no other African-American woman in a nationally recognized medical institution with a more prestigious position was held. Her father was a highly respected surgeon and a cancer researcher um, but she was very modest and her daughters did not know of all her accomplishments until after her death. So now I'll be talking about the barriers to advancing women in rehabilitation fields. I tried to sample several different professions. So uh, I hope they touch on your profession. I'll start out with academic medicine. And, and, that, and the reason for that is because most because the field of medicine is uh, the oldest profession and because there's a great deal more literature on gender disparity in medicine than the other professions. So a paper by Bington in 2015 reported that academic uh, physicians are paid, women are paid less, they have higher rates of attrition, and they think this may be due to a lack of career progression um, we'll talk about that more later. They have fewer publications and fewer first or last author publications. They're less likely to submit NIH grants and less likely to conduct clinical trials. They're less likely to rise to the higher ranks and less likely to become full professors where only 12% of women were full professors as compared to nearly 30% of men. After, and that was after adjusting for age of years since residency. Also, startup packages for basic science faculty positions were 67% greater for men. So I'm discussing these in terms of, of this paper on academic medicine, but these disparities occur across many academic professions. So. Uh, the, the literature is just a little less for some of the other professions. Again, 
the same author reported women were reported to lack mentorship by women and less often selected for lab work by male PIs. In other words, if there aren't enough women elevated to high level positions promoted and um, PIs of labs, there are less women who are mentors and therefore less women agree or can get the credentials in order to be promoted within their position. So we need more women leaders who can mentor other women. Women do not negotiate for salaries as much as men. That's across all professions. Similar, there are similar disparities for racial and ethnic groups, which is another topic altogether. And this may be due, due to social over, overt social injustice and discrimination by the medical community for nearly uh, better part of the 20th century, uh, stemming from some say this Flexner report, which prohibited um, other races from enrolling in medical school. So the other thing that limits women is the acknowledgement of awards. So Julie Silver, who is a, an active par, uh, person in ACRM, also is a, an associate professor and associate director of PM&R at Harvard, and was interviewed on the inter, International Women's Day um, this year. And she said the disparity trends are reflected as well in awards and prizes across areas of medicine and science. So all, all professions, there are more awards given to men than women, whether women don't um, acknowledge awards or get nominated for awards, but there is a disparity in these awards. Uh, women are strongly um, underrepresented among Nobel laureates across all disciplines. She published, uh, Julie Silver, Dr. Silver published many influential studies on gender gap in prizes, awards, and then as well as what I've been discussing, grants and promotions and her advocacy has been critical to raise awareness about these gender in inequities in medicine and other professions. Women are chronically underrepresented for awards as shown by this RAISE project that systematically tracked more than 2,750 awards and calculates the proportion of men and women who win them in the fields of science, engineering, technology, arts, math, and medicine. So um, it would be great if more of that would be acknowledged in rehabilitation as well. So what are some of the facilitators to advancing in academic medicine? One of the solutions might be acknowledging that leaders need training in unconscious or implicit bias. Um, this is really, it's quite clear that any explicit bias is unacceptable, but we all carry some kind of implicit bias that we may not even realize. And there are tools to test what kind of biases we all hold. But as a result, leaders should be training their, their faculty staff about these implicit biases. And so one should ask what kind of training does the leader or the person in which, uh, or the institution in which you're trying to be hired or promoted, to what degree do they implement um, bias training for hiring and for obtaining leadership positions? You need to be asking that question. It's very um, common in uh, major institutions uh, that this is required training for search committees as well uh, to make sure that there is acknowledgement of bias, but also equal representation within the search committees. Also thinking about focusing on, focusing on institutions that have addressed this disparity. If you're thinking about where to apply for a position um, and, and have they developed these strategies to address this disparity? They, it is not out of our purview to say, we understand there's a disparity, a gender disparity in this profession, 
what have you done to address that? And tell me about the successes that you've had in addressing it. And how often do you have, do you address this? Because this kind of assessment should be done regularly to avoid, you know, a drift back to um, inequality. Also, one should look for a fair and standardized interview process. So, for example, uh, is it if if a, a person who was interviewing a man versus a woman and it was sort of an informal interview process, the questions are known to be quite different between how an informal interview to a, a male applicant versus a female applicant. And this is inappropriate. The, stand, the question should be standardized and used regardless of gender. And you can tell this based on either them explicitly saying this, that we ask every candidate these questions, uh, or they have a piece of paper and they're going you know, serially, serially through these questions. That will help you to know. And then the establishment, you can ask about the establishment of an institutional norms for salaries and startup packages. What are the norms for the base salaries for, for faculty or clinicians? What, are, what is the salary range for startup? Um, and then who gets those higher salaries? And then what are the, what is the range of the startup packages, uh, which are typically in academic institutions? So how, Questions to ask are how many years can I um, utilize, stretch my startup package over? And um, are the startup packages the same for everyone? Um, do they all last three years? Are they all X amount of money? Ask those questions. And that will lead you to believe that this institution is addressing equity across everyone, regardless of gender. Because faculty do need to be more diverse. Our students are more diverse, and so our faculty need to be more diverse. So there's more sense of inclusivity. Um, and then remember, equal pay for equal work, right? So if you're comparing yourself to some a very senior person, it wouldn't be appropriate, but try to look at you know, benchmarking yourself with an individual who is um, more along the same caliber that you are or someone that is your uh, along the caliber of your direct supervisor if you're looking for a promotion. Um, and look at, we'll talk about this soon, you know, their CVs and compare them to what you need to do um, to get there. And then also look for flexibility for family formation, paid leave, tenure clock stoppage. And some institutions, uh, one example is University of Utah provided scholarships to women who had family leave and needed a bump, a, a bump in their um, productivity to do their research, created um, a fund for supplies or hiring someone and so forth. So thinking about what's available to catch up when coming back. Um, and then all of these actions can lead to improved morale and retention and promotion and productivity. And just remember to pay it back and mentor other women so other women can enter the field. So I'm going to start addressing other professions now as well. So barriers to advancing women in physical therapy. Um, some of the differences are uh, based on whether a person is a clinician or an academician. But the uh, primary um, gender in, in, the in, a, in the physical therapy profession is female. So really there's more of a gender disparity for males in the profession, but this is changing. This is getting better and better. Uh, <clears throat> however, the overwhelming demographic is white, non-Hispanic with only 5% African-American. And this is something that really needs to be changed. We're working really hard at this at UB. Women um, made up 70, so remember this is, it's 70% female, but women made 77% of the average salary earned by the self-employed male therapist. And salaried female managers earned only 89% of the average salary earned by male managers. And that was in 1998. So we, it's continuing to improve. 
A study done um, in 2007 by male students uh, that looked at male and female students and indicated that male students showed statistically significantly higher odds that women, uh, odds than women, of expecting to own a private practice, become a faculty member, to, um, to become a physical therapist manager or administrator, to publish articles in professional journals, and to have a higher income in the first year of employment. Here's a map of the disparity for therapists that uh, enter the rehab field in rehabilitation centers. And the disparities look like about uh, the smallest being 10,000 between male and female, and the highest being 27,000. Uh, in east, east, south, central region. So we, we have more work to do. Um, so facilitators in advancing in clinical physical therapy are the following. To negotiate and advocate for equal compensation that is commensurate to that value. We have to advocate for equal compensation. But compensation doesn't always have to be limited to salary. Instead, therapists should factor in benefit packages and things like professional development, learning opportunities, work environment, and culture. Some of these other factors can make for a very happy environment, so it doesn't always have to be limited to salary. But there are industry-wide consequences when you play, uh, when at play, when you, as a single provider accept a low ball insurance offer and there and beyond industry-wide consequences when you as a female therapist accept a low ball salary offer or settle for a position beneath your qualifications or abilities, especially when you're getting less than a man would receive. So we really hurt um, the profession by doing these kinds of things where we wouldn't do it with an insurance um, offer. And then also review regional numbers. What are the salary ranges in the region as well as, um, as well before stepping into negotiation? Otherwise you may end up turning down an offer that is perfectly good or maybe even on the high end for the salary ranges in that location. So really do your homework. This is again, all professions. Um, and then there's strong evidence that um, uh, an enriching culture or a cognitively diverse team is really desirable. And this is a team in which the group reflects differences in knowledge, beliefs, preferences, perspectives. I can't think of a more boring place to work if everybody thought the same way, right? We have to, we have to question, we have to learn, we have to challenge each other. Um, and so that's called a cognitively diverse team and looking for that and asking about what is the, what is the culture here? How, how do people interact with each other? Do they, is it acceptable to create a, you know, a divergent thought? And um, to the extent that the, this is revealed um, is debatable, but I still think it's worth um, asking. So barriers for two advancing women in occupational therapy. This is a um, really just one slide here because females dominate occupational therapy by 91% um, and only 9% men. Um, some theories about why men avoid um, majoring in occupational therapy is they avoid feminized jobs because they pay less or hold less social status um, that men may consider it a step down or they are disproportionately pushed into management positions in occupational therapy with better pay or more prestige and less hands-on care, which is fairly sad because of course we have many male patients and having men represented in a profession is also important. So, um, and though they may feel discomfort in a feminized field, men do not face structural barriers in occupational therapy. If men want to be hired or accepted into programs, there's really no structural 
bias that prevents them from doing so. It's, a, it's sort of a personal challenge, a personal preference rather. And then the implications are that there are broader challenges in occupational therapy to the traditional gender norms and trying to um, realize that there's no evidence at this point of gender parity, um, that it's an equity concern that both men and women would be welcomed um, or that recruitment, recruiting masculinity would make a difference in the field. But um, my opinion is that it's, it's stronger when there's equity between genders. And so barriers to advancing women in neuropsychology. So women in neuropsychology are now more dominant in number and their present, presence is strongly associated with specific practice patterns, such as institutional employment, but less involvement with forensic practice, strong involvement in pediatric practice, but this kind of um, selection process by women has also resulted in a sizable gender pay gap in neuropsychology. Um, as the proportion of women neuropsychologists continue to increase, there are flexible work hours and alternative means of remuneration, um, which may be needed to offset the current disproportionate family relation, related responsibilities that occur typically with women. Not always, for sure. Um, but women are also underrepresented in neuropsychology as authors in the clinical neuropsychology journals, but they're becoming more common and their papers are cited just as frequently as the papers authored by men. There is an effort to increase women as research mentors and sponsors, which may help to further close the publishing gender gap in clinical neuropsychology. So they're on their way they're to equality between genders. Um, in terms of speech language pathology and communication disorders, there is about 3.7% of certified SLPs were males in 2016. And 4.4% four and 6% of certified SLPs were males in 20, 2005. So the, there's actually a worsening of the number of males that are um, entering the field of speech language pathology. And so again, we have this kind of reverse gender disparity, much like occupational therapy. One reason might be that men don't know about speech language pathology profession and effort should be made to educate men prior to college entry. Uh, men are sometimes thought as not nurturing, which I think is a fallacy and others do as well. Um, and given the large number of SLPs employed in schools, developing ways to address salary equity from a school-based perspective may be the best way to get the biggest return of male therapists. And there's also some gender differences in languages. And some think that um, because females have a slight linguistic advantage over males, but the effect size are very small, maybe that's a, a confidence um, reason why more women versus men enter uh, the field of speech language pathology. And also remember in this, it's a very challenging time of COVID-19, we have even more challenges for women. Preliminary evidence suggests that women, including female researchers, are disproportionately affected by COVID-19 pandemic in terms of unequal distribution of childcare, elderly care, and other kinds of domestic and emotional labor. Sudden lockdowns and abrupt, sh abrupt shifts in daily routines have had a disproportionate uh, consequence on their productivity. And this has been reflected by a sudden drop in research output in biomedical research, consequently affecting the number of female authors in scientific publications. Uh, some people say that publications have increased during COVID-19 because we we were unable to work in our labs during COVID, so why not work on data and publish? But in fact, women who have family responsibilities at the home had to manage all of that in addition to working from the home environment. So 
hence the reduction in pu publications by women. Um, and so while this topic doesn't, um, isn't intended to address anything but health professions, I just wanted to point out there are some general benefits of women and gender equity in the business sector. So just very quickly, there was a Dow Jones study that showed venture-backed companies are more likely to succeed when women are on executive teams. So think of executive teams in the healthcare environment. And then another author studied women's role in corporate leadership, and they have known for a very long time that companies that have more women on their boards have better results. And it's not just the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do. And a New York Times article said having women in corporate offices is correlated with increased productivity, according to a study of 22,000 publicly traded companies in 91 countries. And Harvard University field experiments said that teams with lower percentages of women have lower sales, lower profits than teams with a balanced gender mix. So we can take this lesson from the business sector and apply it also um, into our healthcare sector. So let's review some of the strategies for hiring um, and promotion that we've talked about so far. So first, know what the regional salary ranges are, do your homework. Know what institutional salary ranges are. In some um, public institutions, those are publicly available online. If not, you have to ask, what is the salary range for starting a new employee in, in, in your institution? And how much does that rise over time each year? What percentage? You know, you really have to pin people down because they don't offer this in interviews or for promotions. Compare your job duties, as I mentioned earlier, such as the years of experience to, to, um, to other people with the same number of years of experience when you're looking for a job um, who are already hired. Compare yourself to them and, and make a decision if you're um, you know, a considered a strong applicant for that position or a strong applicant for promotion. And be prepared to argue for a competitive startup back, uh, package. Really, these are um, key and crucial uh, resources that are needed to, to be successful in an academic environment. Um, and then network with colleagues of similar status to benchmark your approach. How did you go about getting your position? How did you go about get prom getting promoted? Was it just offered or how did you argue for it? Looking at people outside of uh, your institution of interest. Don't be afraid to ask for a promotion, especially if you're doing more than your superior. Uh, and, and ask early and often. Uh, make sure your supervisor knows this is something that you're driven to do and you want to do it. Uh, so um, speak up. Uh, be creative and design new titles if there's a roadblock block to a promotion. Think of a new um, gap in, in tasks and, and create a new title and get you can get a promotion that way. Again, comparing CVs um, to benchmark productivity is, is helpful. One caution though is that some, depending on the, the comparison you're making, some re researchers will produce grants and publications at different rates. For example, basic science researchers will um, produce grants and publications at a slower rate because of the need to collect the data uh, versus people doing secondary data analysis, which um, the data are already collected. And then ask leadership about bias training and plans to address inequities. What are the plans and what are the successes? So let's review and cover a few pointers for the future. First, design a roadmap, but be prepared to pivot as new opportunities arise, and they do. Uh, what do you need to achieve a higher rank to promotion? to get a promotion or a leadership role. What are the exact things that are needed to get to that higher rank? 
know what they are and map it out over time. Keep discussing and expressing your wishes with leadership regularly and ask for guidance on steps to achieve your target. What do I need to do to become uh, at the next rank of associate professor, full professor? What do I need to do to achieve this new leadership position? Interestingly, most, most supervisors don't know how to uh, operationalize promotion to a leadership position. Sometimes it's just an, an effect of time at the institution. Sometimes it's somebody just steps up and takes on leadership roles, but it's very, uh, some people are natural leaders and some people uh, struggle with it, but can do a good job if, if they focus on it. Um, so the, the qualities of a good leader are often opaque when, when you're speaking to uh, either a person who's hiring you or promoting you. Um, seek out mentors outside of your home department to obtain advice from a neutral party and be prepared to go to battle and submit a resignation if need be, if your requests are not met to ensure equity. But have a backup plan, interview at multiple places and obtain an offer. And this is really hard. This is really hard. And that's why I said go to battle because we have, um, you know, situations, homes, families, who knows what obligations that it's hard to move. But if you are finding that you are being stepped over, um, it's not going to get better. So it's really better to um, state your objection, but start developing a battle plan and trying to think where should, where would be a better place to work. And this is really hard to do. It's not something you wanna do often in your career, but it's sort of a red flag and probably not ideal place to work. So in summary, from this book called Beyond Biases and Barriers, they state that without a transformation of academic institutions to tackle the barriers, the future vitality of, US, of the US research base and economy are in jeopardy. They also explain that eliminating a gender bias in academia requires really an overhaul, an immediate overhaul and reform, including decisive action by university administrators, professional societies. I think ACRM is really taking a stance on gender and racial and ethnic diversity. Um, federal funding agencies and foundations. I've seen several women who apply for grants who do not use their first name or use an initial because concerned that maybe there would be a bias if a woman versus a man were to apply for the same grant application and really addressing things with Congress. So if we implement and coordinate across the public, public, private, and governmental sectors, we should see an improvement in the workplace, but going about this is going to be a slow process. Um, doing it through professional societies is one great step, but we really have to address this with our grant funding agencies as well. But ultimately this will improve the workplace environment because employees will feel strengthened and, and the foundation of Americans competitiveness will improve. So my last quote is above all, don't fear difficult moments, the best comes from them. And that was written by Rita Levi Montalicini, uh, who was a Nobel prize winning neurobiologist and developed or co-discovered the nerve growth factor. So with that, I'm happy to take some questions from the chat, which I believe uh, Dr. Kogan will moderate for me. Yes, so if you do have a question for Dr. Sisto, please um, add it to the chat. Um, I don't see any questions yet, but I have one question that I'll start with. Okay. Um, do you have any resources that you mentioned? You mentioned the importance of understanding the salary um, information in an institution and in a region. 
so that you can negotiate for the best offer and for equality. Do you have any suggested resources short of just directly asking the institution what they're offering? Yes, so the Bureau of Labor of Statistics will tell you what the salary range is by region, by state and region. Um, so that's a really great resource to identify what those salary ranges should be. Um, and then each profession also has within their, their bodies uh, a database of salary ranges by state as well. Um, and then, then you wanna negotiate, that's your baseline for negotiation and then it should be up from there because it's really an average value. I was curious if anyone experienced any situations where um, maybe there was implicit bias or um, they did not receive a promotion or were not hired. Let's consider maybe pre-pandemic um, in a way that made you feel a little suspicious. Is there any, any thoughts about how that might have happened and maybe we can chat about what we could do. What are some suggestions to improve that? not seeing any volunteers in the chat um <laughs> i know it's it's yeah. very tough to talk about um from a personal point of view um especially you know not wanting to to reveal certain situations um but i think um among friends these are things to really really discuss and pay attention to um, because I think as women, we have to really elevate ourselves um, to the level of men in the same role. So there shouldn't be any really hesitation. Um, there's sometimes there's, um, there's an element of respect that occurs with women, but that shouldn't ever be perceived as um, and and that can occur among different cultures as well. This uh, very respectful approach, but that shouldn't be um, intended to indicate that, you know, I'll take whatever you give me. You really need to be negotiating what the salary should be and what those hiring or promotion criteria are, not, not to accept. Um, you know, what, what the first offer might be. Yes, and, and to that end, um, I, I think one of the challenges sometimes people have in sharing these stories is that our rehab community is, is rather small um, and, and people wanna be respectful and, and cautious about maintaining relationships. Um, I do know of a colleague who had a, um, she had competing job offers and, and her um, one institution offered her an assistant professor faculty position and the, another institution would only offer her a postdoctoral fellowship. Um, and so that was not too hard of a decision to, to, uh, to make in that case, but um, just, you know, it was really based on what each institution was valuing and how they were, um, yeah, yeah, it's a good example. And I'm wondering if that person, the people who were hiring, maybe had only a funded position for a postdoc versus a assistant professor. I, d I don't really know. Um, but I think that that has to be really transparent up front, you know, so that the person hiring says, you know, unfortunately, um, I know you're applying for an assistant professor, but we, we do not have any open positions. However, I have a postdoctoral fellowship position open so that it, it, it confers a sense of honesty and transparency that the situation has nothing to do with you as a person, 
or, or your gender, but that, you know, this is just the circumstances in terms of funding. Um, you know, so I, I've had situations um, where early on in my career, um, I was um, hired as a lab director. And, um, and this was pretty, pretty early after my PhD, like, really right after. And um, I remember working, really working my butt off trying to, you know, get grants and publications and to build a new lab and all of this. And then I re recall that there was another person hired, uh, a man uh, who was older by age, but not by necessarily productivity, and was paid I'm going to say almost double what I was paid at the time. And when I watched what he was doing compared to what I was doing, it was very disheartening. Um, and so I complained about it, you know, quite bitterly. Um, and there was no real reason um, except that we know that men negotiate higher salaries than women do. So this is what I'm trying to say is that when you're looking for a promotion or you're looking for a position, you really need to start high. Uh, and you get some big wide eyes opening up, but when that happens, they realize you're very serious. Um, start high and then say, well, um, how about if we offer a little less but give you um, this much more in your startup package or something. But really, you know, if you know what the range is or you don't, um, and you compare it to colleagues at other institutions, always start high, um, like really high. And then when the negotiation happens, then you can, you can negotiate down if you have to. That's, that's just something I've learned over the years. And I realized that women do not do that. Um, and I did not either in the beginning. And on that note, there's a fantastic book called Ask For It. And I can't remember the author's name, but she, they actually have two books and it's all about negotiating skills for women. Um, and so I will, if I can try to look that up while we're still on, I will put that in the chat. Uh, we do have a couple of comments. Great. Um, and and I want to also, I, I didn't realize this was an option, but if somebody wants to share something anonymously, you can direct message me. Oh, thank you, Monique. You're a step ahead of me. <laughs> um, and Monique put the link to the book in the in the chat. Um, oh, you great. may send you may send me a direct message and I can read it off anonymously if you don't want your name shared in the chat. Um, um, and one such question was that um, they could, this person could foresee employers trying to use female stereotypes to guilt women into taking lower salaries. For example, you're not in this for the money or our money has to go toward helping others, especially because we're in you know, helping professions. Uh, any ideas on how to address this? Um, that has nothing to do with my salary. <laughs> it has, you know, um, uh, it's all to do with your competence. Um, I've actually heard people say, well, and, and not, not to me, but to others, well, she has a husband. So, um, they, that husband covers, you know, the salary. So we'll, we'll, we don't have to pay her as much, which is extremely insulting, if not illegal to say. So, um, yeah, I would say if, regardless of the helping professions, we need to elevate our professions and not actually ever uh, take anything less because um, we're a woman or we're in the helping professions. We need strong women and strong um, success in our helping professions. Great, thank you for that. Um, and from Monique Papadis, she said that she's seen more issues with potential implicit bias with regards to perceptions of productivity during COVID-19, as well as with regards to promotion and tenure. Um, do you wanna comment on that at all? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, 
I, I agree. Um, and, and I chatted about this a little bit in my presentation where, um, you know, is this implicit bias to make sure I understand your point, Monique? Is it um, because you're a woman, you can't accomplish what men do during COVID because of the challenges associated with home responsibilities while working from home? Um, and that's sort of dismissed as, oh, well, that's why you're not productive. Or is the bias, you know, um, punitive in that you're not being as productive? I mean, I've seen it in all different scenarios. I mean, we talk about this. And when I say we, just faculty uh, colleagues that I have across, you know, in different institutions, um, just how it's perceived on whether one is being productive or not. Uh, you know, those working from home versus those, you know, who come into the office every day, um, you know, um, with regards to, um, you know, the activities that you do, whether that be research or service or whatnot, um, how it's perceived differently for women uh, compared to men, you know, women are, um, are more likely to to be involved in 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 a lot of different service activities and how that's perceived, you know, um, and then you know, yeah, I mean, I could go list all, all these different you know scenarios that that my friends and I we talk about all the time. <laughs> oh, I'm so I'm so glad you brought them up because I think um, I think initially people were of the opinion that if you're working from home, you were probably not really working. Um, right, you know, and even though you were doing everything, probably more because you didn't have to travel to get to work. So you're actually maybe even more productive, but um, there is a disparity between people who come into work versus those who do not. I mean, you can see it even in, in Zoom calls, you know, um, there's, a, there's a different perspective when people are seen from their office versus their their home environment. And I, I, I'm glad that you're talking about it. Um, and one, one thing that you pointed out, I, I was really interested in discussing was service. You know, I think women tend to be more service driven in organizations, societies, professional uh, uh, meetings and uh, versus men, there'll be men, if there's an opportunity to volunteer for something, a woman would be more likely to do that um, than a man. And that's where we really need to step up and say, if we're in a group and somebody's looking for a volunteer and there's men in the group, you try to hold your tongue, just see if the man will step up, you know, or sometimes I'll say, um, you know, I'm really busy. I've got these three major deadlines, you know, John, would you mind running this, you know, uh, leading this group or something? And then you put them on the spot and they're like, oh yeah, no problem. I'll do it. But it, it's not in their nature perhaps to even step up for service. And we need to pull back and say, well, wait a minute, you know, do we, let's wait, just hold a little bit and see if the men in the group might step up. So service was something I really didn't touch on. I think it was a really good point. Um, I wanna be mindful of time. We have one or two more questions, um, but we are almost at the top of the hour. So Dr. Sisto, can we get in one more question? Yes, please. Okay. Um, with COVID related salary increase freezes last year, does anyone have a sense for whether we should try to negotiate larger salary increases this year if and when the freezes are lifted to make up for lost income? And anybody know I, if men are already asking or will be asking? I do not know if men are asking um, because I work at a public university, this is uh, retroactive. So uh, when the freezes, the freezes have been on, on, that have been lifted in New York, um, they'll be retroactive. So there will be no um, disparity in terms of getting back uh, from where we left off. But in other institutions, it'd be really interesting to ask the question, explicitly ask, will everyone get their original base salary 
um, regardless of who they are. Everyone will go back to their original level or will they get X percentage promotion regardless? Will it be equal for everyone? And you have to ask these questions, you know, and they don't like these questions, but they're really important to find out. And then you will understand uh, a great deal more. Well, thank you so much. This was really an excellent presentation. And there are a couple of um, comments about this being a great presentation. So um, I hope you saw those. And um, this, this recording will be available on the ACRM webpage, both through the Career Development Networking Group page and through the ACRM um, resources tab There's a, in the webinar library. Um, and the slides will also be available um, for you to review. So somebody asked about the references. So um, the slides will be available and you can access those. Thank you all so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you all so much. And